So while we uh, while we get labbed up here, uh, just a reminder for everyone: this is networking track. I see some folks joining in. Networking track number two. Uh, we're coming up on uh, um, the last of our two-hour uh, series of on, on based on science, Sonic, and uh, Dave's going to bring us home here on uh, Sonic. Okay, great. So hi, I'm Dave Maltz. It's my honor to be able to present the work of the Sci uh, Science Sonic ecosystem. Uh, I'm an engineer at Microsoft on the Azure networking team. And, and I'll be pressing the button on my computer. <laughs> you can also just tell me. Okay, I'll tell you. Okay, great, thanks. So, I'm very excited to tell you about how the Psyonic and Psy ecosystems have been growing over time. Starting down at the Merchant Silicon layer, we're very pleased to continue to work with Cavium, Barefoot, Centec, Broadcom, and Mellanox. And over the past year, you've seen the new contributions coming in from Nephos and Marvell. At the Switch platform layer, again, continuing the very active work with Arista, Dell, Mellanox, and new this year, contributions from the Switch space from Facebook, Ingresys, and Edge Color. Moving up to applications management and tools, we started the year with MetaSwitch and Microsoft being the two most active organizations working in this space. But again, over the past year, four new major organizations have joined us. Mellanox is extending their contributions up into the application space. Arista joining us with the containerized EOS that you saw earlier. Canonical with the Docker system that we'll show you about more, uh, with the uh, operating system in App Store, we'll show you more. And Docker, which we'll show you more as even part of this demo. So why is Microsoft interested in Science Sonic? I get asked this question a lot. Microsoft operates a global set of data centers with, connected by a wide area network. It represents over a $15 billion bet by our company on our ability to deliver services at high availability and high efficiency to our internal customers like Office 365 and Bing, as well as our external customers who trust us to host their applications on the Azure uh, compute platform. What that means is that availability, reliability of our network is job number one for my team. That is the thing that we wake up every morning focusing on. We go to bed every night hoping that nothing happens until that next morning. <laughs> and so we keep our work dedicated to make sure that. And we see Sonic and Size being a key part of that. And over the course of this talk, hopefully you'll come to understand why that is and why we think Sonic is so critical to that reliability mission for us. Next slide. So this is a picture of our typical data center. You've probably seen pictures like this a lot. Microsoft has been doing this for many, many years. This network uh, topology represents about 15 years worth of continuous learning and evolution. It's a fat tree or clo network architecture. We have servers down at the bottom, each connected up into our, what we call a tier zero or a rack level switch. Then all the racks within a particular row typically connected up to what we call a series of tier one or row level switches or leaf switches. And then all the row level switches will be connected up to a tier two series of data center spines. Now, of course, for high availability and scale out, we have these broad layers, dense mesh of redundant links, connecting then inside of each of our data centers up to a regional spine we call with our tier three networks. If you hit up. And so what we've been doing is we've been bringing in Sonic from the bottom up, replacing the tier zero, or sorry, not replacing, but starting to run Sonic on our tier zero and our tier one level switches. I'm happy to announce we have over 80,000 servers in our data center, production data centers, that are fully dependent on Sonic for their network connectivity, and we're continuing to increase this number over time. The stuff that we're showing you here is real, it's in production, and we're seeing availability benefits from doing that. That's one of the key reasons why Microsoft is so engaged, and we think that other people should be joining and engaging in this too. Let's go ahead. So let me step back again and tell you a little bit about what are the features that we think are essential for having cloud scale software. The first thing is that we have to be able to disaggregate firmware features. If you go to a typical monolithic firmware solution, when you upgrade to the next firmware version, you get every change that's been made in that new firmware version, which may include features that have nothing to do with your use cases and scenarios, but can still break you and cause a life site for your customers. It's also the case that we'll always want to be able to uh, find the best tool for the job, the best implementation. If there's someone who has a more stable BGP implementation than anyone else, we want to be able to use that most stable, most battle-hardened 
uh, implementation of BGP. And that's true for all protocols. Another thing that's really important to us is this notion of hitless upgrades. Our customers, our services are running 24 by 7. There is no maintenance window that would work for them. There's no maintenance window at all. So we have to be able to do continuous upgrades to our infrastructure in a way that our customers don't see the impact. Now what that means is that I need to be able to fix bugs, apply security patches in hours, so that when we do detect a problem, we can root cause it, code the fix, and get that fix deployed out there to keep any of our other customers from being impacted by that problem. And I need to be able to roll out new features across all of that infrastructure, hundreds of thousands of switches in days. So the ability to go into our firmware and update each part of it as necessary is a critical requirement for us. Third key feature is development environment. We have a pretty large developer team. At Microsoft, we know something about software. We'll write an awful lot of it. And part of that means that I have to be able to give each of my developers a test environment where they can spin up software, try things out, learn from their mistakes, and debug quickly. Now, we have test labs with physical infrastructure. That's a critical part of every uh, release qualification process. But I need each dev to be able to do things on their laptop, in their dev VM, where they can sort of get that first level of sanity checks on their uh, software. And the more realistic I can make that emulation, the faster the whole development velocity cycle goes. So one of the things we've been doing over the past year to make Sonic better is containerization. So this is an overview of the various containers that we have inside of Sonic with the idea that once we've containerized and made Sonic a, containerized, a suite of containerized features and components, that moves us towards that desire to be able to go in and rapidly upgrade any one of these components independent of the others. It also makes it easier for us to mix and match components that might have been compiled in different environments or with different operating system settings. Let's go ahead. Okay. So containerization is something that's very uh, becoming prevalent in the industry. There are many benefits that have been well established in terms of software engineering and software development and deployment for that. You get this clean isolation boundary, all the configuration settings, operating system, uh, uh, packaging that's required for that is containerized with that. You get a nice deployment package. That makes it easy to take these new features, which may come from different places, and roll them out. It gives us an easy upgrade boundary. It's transactional. You are running one version of the container or the other version of the container. There's very nice mechanisms to help move forward from one declared state of what should be running to a new declared state of what should be running. And there are tools and orchestration systems that can help us orchestrate that, not on just a single switch, but across our fleet of entire switches. And it's universal. One of our goals, you've heard this again and again, is to treat our switches the way we treat our servers. We're really good at running software on servers. And if we could bring that same level of discipline and excellence to our switches, we would have a very available network for our customers. And that, again, is job one. So by taking containerization and putting it to Sonic, what have we gotten? Serviceability, right? By upgrading containers, we can service and add new features or bug fixes into any part of the Sonic stack. We get extensibility. Rolling out a new feature is either adding another container to the existing uh, uh, fleet of running containers or taking a container and replacing it with a new one. Development agility. Again, our developers can work in different environments even. And when they are ready to deploy, they package that up inside of a container, and now they have it a good deployment unit that our orchestration systems know how to take and roll out across all of our switches. And cross-platform. I guess I sort of alluded to this earlier. We actually will show you in the demo how we can take code that came from different flavors of Linux and actually get them all running on the same Sonic platform. Okay. What I'm going to do next is uh, show you a demo. These demos you can see running live uh, over in the Microsoft booth or in some of our partner booths. Um, but to capture and to keep me from saying the wrong thing, we're going to use a recording for right now. And, whoops, and now it's when we start hoping that our text is really going to work. Do, do, do. It works so well when you do it on a... In this demo, I'm going to show you the Sonic containerized design. Here is the Sonic device. There are eight containers running. Each container hosts a service. 
The database container hosts the release database. BGP container runs BGP protocol. If you want to manage the BGP protocol, you can log into the BGP container and check BGP status as well as configuration. Next, I'm going to show you one advantage of using container, the easy portability across the machines. Imagine you do not like Quagga BGP stack and want to use another BGP stack. Sonic allows you to do that by just running another BGP container. Here is another Sonic box. Instead of Quagga BGP stack, this box is running Arista US BGP stack in a container. Let's log into this container. This container is based on Fedora 18. Without container, if you, run, if you want to run this BGP stack on top of Sonic, you need to recompile all the source code under Debian Jesse. However, with, with container, you can simply take the binary and run it in a container. Here is a US BGP configurations. And we can also see the BGP session is up. And this box is learning routes from the peer. Other than this BGP container, this Sonic box is the same as other Sonic box. So you can log into the switch day service and check all the routes here. So the Arista BGP stack know, learn all the BGP routes and sync them into switch day service and then use a Sonic stack to manage the ASIC. So what you're seeing here is that if you're familiar with router CLIs, using Sonic with the appropriate set of containers running on top of that can look like a lot like driving switches that you're used to. It's also a software platform. So underneath the covers, we're using the Redis database to be part of that switch state service. And so you can get new advanced functionalities by dealing with that switch state service, that Redis database, using standard software mechanisms. And if you're familiar with Docker, again, probably many of the commands that you saw, you'd recognize as being just standard container uh, Docker mechanisms. Let's go there. OK. The next demo I'm going to show you is going to speak to how we can use P4, which you've heard about previously, to create an emulation of the ASICs and the data path that can, then can be used, it, again, with the containerization strategy, to create multiple switches that a dev can run on their laptop as part of their testing, uh, testing suite infrastructure. Let's see if we can. Oh, it sounded like it goes. We also build a Sonic P4 Docker, which contains a full Sonic software stack inside one Docker. It runs on top of a P4 software switch, which allows us to run Sonic without a real switching ASIC, so that we can test the Sonic software on a normal server. In this demo, we build a four-node test bed. Host 1 connect to switch 1, and host 2 connect to switch 2. Switch 1 and switch 2 are connected via BGP and the switch one advertises subnet to switch two, and the switch two advertises subnet to switch one. Now we start the test bed. It downloads the Sonic P4 Docker files and set up the test bed. Now you can see there are four dockers running, host 1, host 2, switch 1, switch 2. So we can log into switch 1 and check if the BGB session are up or not.
you can see the BGP session are up, is up. And it received the routes advertised by hosts by switch to. Since it's a full Sonic stack, you can play with it. For example, you can log into the Redis database and check its interest. Now the BGP session up and we can ping from host 1 to host 2. Okay, great. So what you just saw there was that ability, once we have this, uh, the containerized architecture that's been put into Sonic, you can now take those containers and bring them up and use them in the flexible ways that your engineers are probably already used to using them. Now, I wouldn't try and run a performance test across that, but you can see that the data path is up and working and it forwards packets. That's pretty cool. Our engineers have found this to be tremendously useful. The next thing I'd like to tell you about is some work that we've been doing um, uh, to now manage all of those sets of containers that we have out there. I'd like to make a special call out to Dong Lo Chen and the Docker team for working with us to get the Sonic containerization going, and then help us bring those containers in with Swarm, which is Docker's simple, extensible, uh, powerful, and secure method for managing containers. With just a f uh, very few components, pretty easy to use. You can actually then manage clusters of containers across multiple switches in your environment. Let's go forward and see that demo. In this demo, we're going to show Gitless BGP upgrade through Docker Swamp. In this topology, we have Spy and Tor running Go BGP. We plan to upgrade BGP stack on the leaf node from Quagga to Go BGP. We have built Quagga and Go BGP Docker and stored the Docker's in the Docker registry. We're also running a Docker Swamp manager to upgrade the Docker on the leaf node. In the demo, we'll first put the leaf into maintenance mode and keep the ASIC routing table freeze temporarily before we stop the Quagga. Then we're going to stop Quagga and start Go BGP and finish the BGP stack swampy. In the whole process, you will see that ping is working from spine to the tor throughout DOT. Now we're going to show the demo. So we have already started the Quagga BGP Docker, and the ping from the spine to the tor is working. Now run a command on our leaf node to freeze the routing table on the ASIC temporarily. Now remove the Quagga BGP Docker using Docker Swan. So this is now on a management console here. Imagine this is console on one, that switch, that leaf switch they're doing an upgrade on. Now the on. Quagga Docker is removed and the spine detects the leaf is done and start the graceful restart process. Also on the leaf node, let's check the routing table. So here we are and back on the leaf. And the leaf node have full routing table and then the pin is working. Now start the go BGP Docker using Docker Swamp. So back on the management console. So go BGP Docker is started on the leaf node. And we'll see when the peer detect the BGP session is up again. So now we're watching this uh, router output on the spine to see when it sees the new BGP session now come up. Now the peer detect the session is up and then the graceful restart process is finished. So now let's resync the new routing table into the ASIC. And now we're going to tell the leaf it's okay During to release its process, freeze. The ping from the spine to the tor is working without a single drop. We have finished the hit list and upgraded the BGP stack. Okay, great. So that's three short demos. There's a lot more available at the Microsoft booth and the booths of our partners. Again, as Shin said earlier, Sai, 
We have multiple um, sets of ASICs packaged into different switches by multiple vendors, running Psi and Sonic as a common theme, but then running different sets of management applications on top of them. And you can also see a switch back and forth. You can see a couple of other things. We've got the wedge switch going. You can see us doing 100 gig links, RDMA and some of the values of that. Swarm as a way of doing management for this. Our containerization strategy and how that's paying off for us in terms of dev agility. And of course, the most important thing is actually about you. This is an open source project. I've explained to you why Microsoft is so committed and invested in this. But really, the strength of Sonic and Sonic is going to come from participation from the industry overall. That's what's going to help battle, harden, and test every line of code that we're all then going to be able to benefit from as we run it in our networks. We're looking for contributions in all of the areas, side, new hardware platforms, new features, applications, and tool, test suites. All of these things are going to help make this a better ecosystem that all of us can confidently use inside of our networks. You can join us by starting out on our website. We're currently on GitHub directly. We have a project mailing list. The source code is all available. You can go download it right now. There's a wiki, and perhaps of interest for people who want to start kicking the tires on the wiki, we have a page that will show you um, for many, many different switches, we have uh, pre-compiled uh, binaries available that you can download and start playing with. And you can see the font is so small you can't even read it. We have so many participants now. Go to the wiki, look it up, see if the switches that you're using are there. And if not, think about joining in and making a contribution, getting involved. So thank you. Happy to take a few questions. Shin, behind you? Oh. Oh, sorry. Uh, this might be a multi-part question, so forgive me. Um, I assume, first of all, all your containerized features are written to your Psi implementation? That's right. And I assume well, further that your Psi implementation is written to access your ASICs directly from user space, or do you proxy them through the kernel? Uh, we, I'm not even sure how to answer that question. Someone help me out. Go on. Or Reason being, by are you proxy, the... if the answer to the second question is yes, do you then, ha have you then granted all of your containers direct access to your hardware, and is that not a security concern? No. So the containers themselves are not directly running Psi. Psi is running as part of the Sonic infrastructure containers. The management and application tools are talking to the switch state service going through that Redis cache, and then there's switch sync D, which is then taking what's in the Redis data and the, 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 schemata, the, the schema of the Redis data, and then actually making calls via Psi into the ASIC to get the ASIC to be do the right thing and match what the um, switch state D has been told to do. Yeah, ATP is effectively communicating through some non-hardware protocol to that's, some other service that's then communicating That is correct. Actually, if we, um, yeah. Yeah, so if you look at, stare a little bit more inside the, the sonic space, then what's happening is your network management applications are basically talking to the database, the switch state uh, uh, database, which is, which is then used to take data, store it, get that down into the ASIC via Psi, and also then provides the communication channel between different agents. So it's kind of like a pub-sub model, and this is how agents can see what each other are doing and communicate that way. But it's secure in that they can't actually go and corrupt what's on the ASIC. Yeah, just want to add one thing is that uh, uh, in the Sony project, uh, all the applications talk to the database directly, and then all the vendors, they not only provide SI, but also package the SI into a container, so they deploy, they provide the container to every, on every platform, and then that container can access those hardware through whatever mechanism that the vendors uh, supports. Then um, our applications only to talk to the database. Okay. Thanks, Gohan. So just want to add one more point. Uh, I think when you ask about the question about containers, so uh, by default, a lot of time, containers do not have the privilege mode to talk to the hardware directly. Well, Very deep, does, right. right. In this case, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for Donglo here. So Donglo can probably explain the host mode and privilege mode a little bit. Um, so Docker is working on uh, host networking. So it will support uh, you can deploy to use the host network just mm -hmm. you, in Swarm. I mean, Docker always support the host networking, but in Swarm, we are going to support that in the service level. 
Uh, the other one is uh, the security concern. Uh, Docker used to just have a privilege mode that you can do anything. Um, what we are moving into is a capability uh, specific uh, thing. So you have to specify what you are going to support in this uh, service. So you, you wouldn't be accidentally allowing anyone to run any container uh, with uh, all the privilege. Okay, great. Uh, not, any other questions? Do we have time? Um, and you mentioned about the uh, containers, and you said don't do performance testing on the on that container. I wanted to see oh. if you were able to push the envelope. Were you able to get line rate uh, kind of throughput or? Uh, okay, so, so so to be clear, the scenario that we're doing there is that we have a developer who's taken a laptop, you know, and is now running, uh, as you saw in that demo, f say four containers, two hosts two switches, and we're using a software emulation of the data plane, which has been modeled in P4. So the code path that you have to go through to send a packet through that data path has got a fairly significant slowdown. So when I say don't do a performance test on that, what I mean is don't try and do a TCP max transfer through that you know, software emulated data path and think that that's going to represent the performance you're going to get in production. Now, if you're doing uh, control plane level experiments, there, the, the, you know, so long as you have a reasonably powered CPU, the kind of measurements you're going to get are probably much more predictive. So let me be clear. I was talking about it's an emulated data path at that point. It's as accurate as the P4 model of the data path is. So you could test out you know, all the features of that data path, encapsulation, decapsulation, ACL2 mapping. It's just um, you can imagine all the lines of code that are being executed for each packet that's getting sent through because there's no ASIC acceleration for that. Um, since, you since you mentioned that, like, uh, the performance uh, testing in the control plane, I was wondering, um, do you will we uh, want to share some result on your BGP loading time? I, basically, I want to see, like, uh, do you see any perform penalty when it goes through the Docker, goes through the, data, the database, uh, then eventually going to the, the side? Okay. Gohan, can you take that one for me? We should have Gohan a couple. Good catch. Yeah, so, um, so there, there's no performance penalties uh, from the using the Docker because the Docker, the basically one is they introduce a C group that you can just control all those, um, just as a, you know, have a, have a bit to group all those processes. So there is no overhead in terms of uh, um, running, running time, uh, execute those, all so those binaries. Go on, yeah. I, think the, I think the real question is, you know, how long does it take for a prefix to go from a routing application down into the? Yeah, so so we measure the Redis database on the, on our um, our platforms. We use a pipeline mode, and it can take um, on the normal switches. We measure it can take a, um, a 100k uh, a set uh, operations per second, um, and we measure also measure the the, the BGPs that syncing from our uh, Redis database and. Um, to, to the ASIC, that's about uh, 1,000 uh, 1, K routes per second. That is the current uh, performance number for our BGP stack. Okay. Oh, sorry, uh, 1 K, 1 K routes per second, sorry. <laughs> okay, great. Maybe one more question? All right. So back to BGP. So the most expensive operation in your router today is rip to fib download. If you have, I'm here. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. If you put add path on it and multipassing across it, it will take you about 10 minutes to download routing table. So 650k of today's internet routing table. It's unworkable. So, so this is why we're opening this up for group contributions. The industry started with you know less than super fast BGP routing times, and when that became clear that that was we needed to get to larger scale for the default free internet backbone. The community responded and made the code fixes and accelerations to do that. All of that can be done in this space. Again, I'll be very upfront. I've been driving this with requirements to make large cloud scale data centers more available. We haven't been taking Sonic yet and running it as a default free internet backbone router. But there's nothing that says that we can't. And what we're trying to show you is that this is a great platform to do that innovation on, because when you make the fixes there, you're going to be participating and embedding it from all the tools and applications that overall ecosystem. This isn't a finished product. This is the start of a great thing.
Uh, from your perspective, have you looked into IPC subsystem, how to distribute routes, communication between Redis and FIPS? Any ideas how to improve it? I'm gonna say, let's take that one offline. I think it's a good sure. conversation to have, but I see people coming in the room, so. Cool. Thank, Thank you. Right. Thanks again, Dave.